Welcome to Beauty and the Biz. Discover how to grow your practice with effective cosmetic patient attraction, conversion, and retention advice from author, speaker, trainer, and cosmetic practice business and marketing coach, Catherine Maley, MBA. Hello and welcome to Beauty and the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, and consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's special guest, I love this because he's the newer up-and-coming plastic surgeon. He's a younger guy, but then he just told me he's not that young, so I'm getting really old because, um, anyway, he's not, he's mid. So let me just tell you about him. It's Dr. Mike Nyack of Nyack Plastic Surgery and Avana Derm Spa. Now, Dr. Nyack is a board-certified facial plastic surgeon in private practice. He has been for the last 14 years in De Pere, Missouri. And actually, it's 15 miles outside of St. Louis, Missouri. He's actually got two locations, and we'll talk about those. Now, he's a graduate of Yale University, where he majored in molecular biophysics and biochemistry. And he's earned his medical degree from Washington University. Now, Dr. Nyack did his residency at Harvard Medical School and general surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. He then completed a fellowship with the Glasgow Group for Plastic Surgery. And he's an active member of the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, as well as the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery. We both speak there, and he regularly presents at the national meeting. Now, Dr. Nyack specializes in rhinoplasty, facelifts, and injectables, and his private practice includes a state-of-the-art accredited surgical facility, as well as a Vani Derm Spa that offers non-surgical services such as facials, makeup, spray tan, waxing, injectables, cool sculpting, and lots of other lasers, and we'll talk about his business setup. And he also started his own skincare line under the name Avani. Now, his humanitarian efforts include an annual trip to Hanoi, Vietnam, to provide reconstructive surgical services, as well as to teach local surgeons his own innovative techniques. Now, Dr. Nayak also offers pro bono rhinophyma reduction services to those who qualify. Now, to keep him and all of these profit centers running smoothly, it looks to me, from uh, what I found on his team photo on his website, he's got a team of over 41 people, and that includes his wife. So welcome, Doctor, to Beauty and the Biz. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Sure, no problem. So, of course, we have to still talk about COVID because that's still the number one conversation. So what's happening in Missouri with COVID and with your practice? Well, um, like everyone else, Friday the 13th of March was kind of our last real day. And uh, that that weekend, it became pretty evident that um, we really couldn't operate the, as a non-essential business. And we did have some local local peers that kept on right through the uh, the lockdown under the auspices of being a doctor's office. But you know, I like to joke all the time. You know, I used to be a doctor. We're not a real doctor's office anymore. And so we closed down, um, and we we remained completely closed through the 18th of May. So Missouri is a little bit of a uh, Wild West kind of state, man. Um, our our government is very localized. It's not very state led. So the state pretty much says, okay, you local counties decide what to do more than the the state governments can take over. So uh, the state government was, is has been more um, uh, lenient or that kind of stuff. So, but our, but our local county, St. Louis County, has been a little tighter. So May 18th was when St. Louis County um, said that certain non-essential businesses could uh, start to reopen. So May 18th, which was two months into lockdown, uh, is when I started doing surgery again, um, elective surgery again. And so we started with that because it's a subset of our staff. It's, you know, maybe six staff members that need to come in for that. Um, it's one or two patients a day that we could realistically PCR COVID test. And we can start just a small group work out the kinks a little bit. So we did a week from May 18th, which was a Monday to the end of that week, just getting back into that feel of actually being back at work and a very limited number of people. Uh, May 25th, the week later was Memorial Day. So the day after that, Tuesday, we brought back the rest of the staff, um, but we didn't see any patients. So we just had the, right, we have, we have, depends on the day, we have between 45 and 50 staff members. So 
we had um, the staff come back, populate the two offices, um, but just getting used to all the new routines, you know, the how to check in and how to screen and what, how to wear your PPE and what's appropriate for what circumstance. Um, and we got them used to treating wearing all this stuff because we had, you know, almost 50 staff members that had not had their treatments in two months. So that was a way for us to let the staff get all their treatments again. So they were all happy. And it was a way for the staff who was on the treating end to practice doing treatments, wearing this cumbersome PPE. So that was the second week that we were open. And then June 1st was the third week that we were open. And that was when we kind of opened up to patients in general, um, probably at about 70% scale so that we could have an adequate breaks and sanitation and, and that kind of, and also just to give the staff a you know, chance to take their mask off, catch their breath and all that kind of stuff. By the way, you did one of the best um, COVID um, um, safety video that I've ever seen. If anyone gets a chance, you have to go to nyacplasticsurgery.com Instagram, and he's got all his staff in this video. Who, who was the director? It's almost like a production. Um, that, I mean, you, you put some effort into that video, and it was so carefully laid out. All the staff is involved, and you are explaining to a patient, because what are the two biggest issues with a patient right now? Safety and the economy. Like those are the two biggest issues for all of us. So you, you handled that beautifully. Like, this is what to expect when you come in, and you went step by step by step. Um, that was excellent. How long did that take to shoot? Well, I tell you, so I'm, I'm really blessed with an amazing staff. So um, what I did is I wrote, uh, I wrote the screenplay, if you will, mm -hmm. um, the various scenes and lines. And then I actually have an employee who's my social media director, Jenna, and I'd love to give her a little shout out here. Mm -hmm. So I... I communicated to Jenna, here's the screenplay, and then here's my vision for what I want to happen. Um, and because this, I wanted each staff member to, you know, we're walking through steps A through Z, and so we wanted the patient to be able to see what this was going to look like, but be told by the familiar, not just me lecturing for five minutes, you know, be told by the various familiar, friendly faces in our staff. And that was a peak COVID time, so we couldn't really have Jenna film the staff member unless the staff member was wearing a mask, and then that's not a really good um, that's not a really good uh, visual to have someone talking through a mask at you. So what we did actually is I, I wrote out the screenplay and I told Jen I wanted her to assign a line, each line of the what we want to an individual staff member and then just flip them out in different parts of the building and they actually selfied each line. And that way simultaneously, you know, 15 or 20 people have many were involved in video, simultaneously are out there recording their line until they were happy with it. And then they, they sent back their raw material to Jenna. She edited it. We had that whole thing done in like four hours. No kidding. I, last time I looked, you had over 2,000 views on that. I'm That's sure good. Since then, but it was killer. I, I highly recommend everybody start thinking that way. You know, and if you can get that staff person, I was thinking, are you literally doing your own social media? Because that was a big deal. So you've got a good person on staff. I think, I frankly think, um, well, we'll talk about marketing later, but I think everyone's going to have a videographer on staff and a social media director on staff. I think you have to. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's just talk about you have a very unusual business structure um, because and you've got all these staff. Did, did all the staff come back? I mean, how what happened to everybody? So um, it's really interesting. So all but one of our staff that we started with at the lockdown, mm -hmm. all but one has returned. That one is selling so much online product now through our online channels that she's effectively replacing her original revenue. And she'll probably still come back anyway, but she's, she's particular, she's got personal reasons to be particularly uh, cautious right now. Mm -hmm. um, so when she does come back, I, I know she will, but I'm not sure if it's going to be in the next you know, week or two. Um, until then, she's actually replacing her take home quite nicely just with online skincare, which is fantastic. Um, and we've hired like six more because um, there are new jobs. We're do it takes it takes 1.25x the effort to execute 1x the work compared to pre-COVID. So, you know, there's a whole new job called a gatekeeper. Someone to sit at the front door and you know screen temperatures and oxygen saturations and and orchestrate getting in and out of cars and all that kind of stuff. That's a, that takes a human being. Mm -hmm. And if we're open, you know, 50, 60 hours a week in two locations, that's 120 hours of three full-time employees, mm -hmm. you know? So we've actually added like four or five part-time employees to capture those 120 hours worth of extra work. So everyone came back minus one and we've added four or five more. 
did you extend your hours to try to cover for the loss of the volume that you used to enjoy? No, I would, I would, it's, it's interesting. So it, every, every decision that we make is, there's always a tension between, you know, what's the plus and what's the minus. And, um, when we got, we had a few meetings leading up to reopening, a few virtual meetings leading up to reopening, and there was significant uh, um, hesitation uh, and significant kind of, it wasn't, it wouldn't have been great if we said, let's extend hours. Um, and I can understand it because, you know, at that point, there was still no path, there was no, there were no camps open, there were no daycares open, you know, so if we extend hours, who's going to, who's going to watch these kids? You know what I mean? So it wasn't, it wasn't, just like a lot of my peers are like, oh, we're going to extend hours to make up for the slow people and missing two months. Um, we could have maybe forced the issue, but it, it was, you know, we really try to have to balance happiness, like team happiness with um, patient happiness. It's not even about revenue. It's about patients want to get in. There's only so many slots that the team has to have a life too. You know what I mean? So um, we did not extend hours with short answer. So how much do you think you have decreased your flow percentage wise? Due to all the new precautions that you have to take. So surgery is, is as busy as it ever was because that's okay. easy. I can, I can fill surgery all day and it's only two to three human, be, human beings. You know, it's two or three patients because mm -hmm. facial surgery is slow. You know, it's, a nose might be two hours and a full face rejuvenation might be all day. And so I'll do, you know, two to three procedures a day. So that two to three is the same. Mm -hmm. The non-surgical side, um, Again, we've only been open on the non-surgical side for 21 days now. Um, we started low, like probably 60%, 70% the first week. Um, I'd say now we're probably up to 80 plus percent. But it's because everyone was, a lot of people were just nervous to come back. Like actual staff members were, that's why I did that pre-opening week where everyone just was with each other. I mean, you have to re-socialize human beings. They're, they're not used to being outside their house. Mm -hmm. leave alone the crowd with other people, you know, and then wearing this foreign stuff. Like in the OR, like we're so used to wearing masks, we don't care. Mm -hmm. You put that on your medical assistant and it's just very foreign, you know. Um, so we started slow. We are steadily ramping up um, as we have more confidence and as the systems become easy. You know, it's, you, you don't start off swimming three miles a day. You start off swimming a quarter mile, maybe, you know, and as you become efficient, then you can extend it. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've become more efficient. We're probably 85%. That's probably where we'll stay for a little while. Did anybody get sick at all? Not so far. Uh, we, okay. we all know in St. Louis, we all know people who have been sick. Hmm. We have, I mean, with the large staff, statistically, someone's going to get sick at some point. But we don't okay. have any staff members yet that have gotten sick. Very lucky. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. Although, did it hit Missouri very hard? Uh, it didn't hit Missouri hard, but it hit St. Louis County, where, where I live. It hit St. Louis County. We're, of, of the cases in Missouri, most of them in our county. Mm -hmm. As long as we're talking about staff and business, who's managing all these people? That's a great question. So I have, I have um, so Avni, my wife, is still involved in the practice and kind of as an inside outsider. So she does not work there hours a day or even every day of the week. But when she comes in, she's very good at kind of structure and noticing things and suggestions and ideas and, and kind of business development kind of thing. Um, but that's just as, as she sees opportunities, it's not a structured position. Mm -hmm. um, my two kind of real leadership team in the office is my office administrator and my office manager. And I have two different people. Um, the office manager is what you just asked, HR, um, payroll, um, minor stats between people, you know, enforcing rules. Um, Congratulating people, recognizing good behavior, um, hiring, firing, um, employee files, um, health insurance, all that kind of stuff. That's the office manager. And it's just so it's kind of like office mom, you know, um, you know, literally kind of getting the sense that someone's literally talking about their problems at home. You know, like that's that's office manager. And uh, that person has been with me a little over 10 years and she's outstanding. She's really, really good. She started out as an anesthetician, actually. My no, kidding. Yeah. So she was my office manager by the time she was 29, which is kind of weird. Like, a, you put a multi-million dollar business in the hands of a 29-year-old, you know, but she's she's great. Um, so that's her. Um, and then the office administrator um, is more, you almost think it was like director of implementation. Like, she's the one that gets stuff done. So the COO? What's that? Kind of like, like the COO. Yeah. So, you know, if I say, 
I'm looking to change my phone service. I'm going to, you know, investigate three or four voice over IP platforms and then come to me with a digested presentation of what you looked at, what you saw, and what your recommendations are. And so I'll, I won't hear about that for three or four days and she'll come back with a package, you know, um, or if I want to implement, she's also kind of my in-house IT person. So if you think of um, like the legal analog would be big companies have an in-house lawyer, that in-house lawyer can't do all the legal work themselves. They're not specialists in all the different things that they might need to do. Um, but they can hire the specialists and speak their language and, and, and manage those specialists while they do the actual heavy lifting and then the in-house lawyer is kind of the liaison. So mm-hmm. she's also my in-house kind of IT person. She's, she's not directly writing a website. She's not doing all that. She does a little minor maintenance and upkeep, mm-hmm. um, but she is, she is the person that I go, this is what I need. And then she'll go find out what happens and make it happen. So mm-hmm. she is the get stuff done person like projects tasks um um almost anything that touches it will go through her and then the other one is the keep people happy person so there's people thing people employee and the processes employee and together they're my management team but what about the money part because it seems to me with having such a big team as a consultant i would typically say okay let's break them into teams by profit center and then they will Anyway, I have a whole thing that I do on that when I go to a practice of like your size. We it needs culture and it needs um, KPIs and it needs processes and um, it needs a lot more structure than that informal. Because I'm sure ten years ago it was very informal. What did you start with a few people and look at you now? Um, can you just talk about your business structure because you have two locations and a whole lot going on? Um, and I would like to ask you about your services as well because. Um, when I looked at your website and I saw that you have estheticians, but even spa services like spray tan, waxing, I'm thinking, is that really a good, it's not a good um, profit center. I know that for a fact. However, it is if you can make, I'm assuming you're going with that umbrella approach. We are the one-stop shop. I'm assuming that's where you're going with that. And I hope to God your staff is really good at up, upselling, cross-promoting all services, that kind of thing. But anyway, back to business. How did you set all this up? I just look, as, as time goes on, you know, there each almost every one of these positions becomes. Um, it's not like you you go, oh, I need one of these. I'm going to make one, and it, it need, pain points arise, and you go, I really need to put a person in charge of this. Like we have a we have a purchasing, inventory, and fulfillment person. Um, I, if you had told me. Five years ago, I'd have a full-time employee whose job is to do nothing but buy stuff, know what stuff we already have, and mail stuff out the door. I'd be like, you kidding me. There's, that's a full-time job that we have. It became evident maybe two years ago that we needed someone to, you know, we there'd be toner cartridge out and four people would order it, you know? And so, yeah. and not only would four people order it, there's already one in the closet, you know? So we have one in-house, four different people ordered it, all four come in, no one knows where they are, and yeah. it's, you know, it's a, it's. So we it's actually need, as we find needs like that, we create jobs. So when I first started, I had um, one esthetician um, and no nurse injectors. We have to realize this is in 2006 when I started private practice. So I had no nurse injectors, I had one esthetician. Um, and that esthetician was, I mean, she would help me as a medical assistant here and there. And in between things, she would do um, non-ablative lasers. So Missouri estheticians can do non-ablative devices. She was doing no facials, no spray chains, no waxing. It was the only thing she did service-wise was non-ablative lasers, and then she'd help me. As we grew and got to a bigger footprint, um, so we're, we're in Missouri. We have, you know, space upon space upon space. The hardest part of a lot of this is you're kind of implying they're this profitable and then the less profitable offering. Mm-hmm. So we're always squeezing out the least profitable offerings in favor of more profitable offerings. We had nails and massage for a while, you know, but um, those got squeezed out in favor of other things. Um, the, as we grew, then we could, we could actually take our estheticians and let them do other typical aesthetics things like facials, like, like, uh, peels, like microdermabrasion, all that kind of stuff. Back then it was even pre-microneedling, which they can't do in Missouri, but, um, it was just all those, those types of things. Spray tan, one of my employees, you know, I came to me maybe seven or eight years ago and said, we need to do spray tans. And I said, just what you're just, just implied. You're crazy. Spray tans are not a profit center you know like why would we do that and uh and there's every corner has got a spray tan 
yeah. operation on it, you know. Um, and so we we did add it. Um, it was actually, I mean, is it is it a super profitable thing? No, but it makes people happy that that the uh, estheticians like to do it. Um, we don't do it at a price that that we won't do it for, you know. So if they're looking for ease and convenience while they get their facial get the spray tan and walk out the door, we're we're there for you. If you're looking for the absolute cheapest spray tan you can get, you might want to go somewhere else, you know. And so it, that limits the number that we do. Um, we do a, a value a value based number, yeah. um, and it's been it's been successful. As a matter of fact, right before COVID, we were we were literally considering this is one of these things where I was just saying you kind of develop. I think this is a job all by itself, you know, spray tan tech, just a person that just mans the spray tan room. You know, um, we actually have one room in each campus so it would be two spray tan techs just just to peel those out from the estheticians mm -hmm. um right now we're not doing any spray tans because with covid you know i think that'd be hard to say that if that patient or that's that employee was positive i don't care what kind of mask you're wearing when you're blowing that mm -hmm. thing around the room i don't think that's really controlling anything so right now that's on pause actually what i do as a consultant how i handle that i look at the revenue stream as you have built right now and then i look at the counter to that and i say okay what if instead of you providing spray tans um everyone's everyone's doing it already anyway for another price would you be better off having somebody develop relationships and alliances with the spray tan people and let those girls be a good referral source to you same thing with estheticians same thing with hair all of this is it better to do it yourself or sometimes align with the neighborhood and not fight them and not compete with them but turn them into your ambassadors that's how I know it would just be a numbers game and you just test it out and try it that way. Yeah. Anyway. And then, um, and then the, 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 the intangible part of that is what makes people happy, you know? So it is not necessarily that the most profit, the highest profit per minute or square foot operation is also the highest happiness for staff and patients operation, you know? So we're always kind of balancing. We're like, we're, it's not like we're in a grocery store and a restaurant business where we have 1% margins and you know, we're going right. to live or die on some of these decisions. Like, I have staff members that love doing spray tans, you know, and I have patients that love getting them and we, you know, we can do it. So I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Like there are certainly things that you, you honestly, like if I, if you really take it to the extreme, I should stop doing surgery and just make, I make my living through a 30 gauge needle all day and it might be more profitable. You but think? I'd be happy. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah How much do your revenue is out. surgical versus non-surgical percentage? What was, what was that? What are your revenues percentage wise surgical versus non-surgical? I can't tell you exactly, but it's 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 majority non-surgical now. Um, yeah, not personal because I I do I I almost exclusively operate anymore. Mm -hmm. But there's there's one of me, and then there's 15, 17 non-surgical providers. So when you have one surgeon, and I on a normal year um, we would travel like you know 13, 14 weeks a year. So I work about seventy five percent of the time, and I do surgery, and it's one guy, and then you have. 17 non-surgical providers that are more kind of they're all round more just just by numbers that that side is going to become the heavier side of the room. but that's by design like i mean I, I i want it to be when i leave the office that that we're still doing just fine you know that I, I'm, not, I'm not a slave to the machine that i built well i used to run a surgeon's coaching club with ed williams um oh yeah of state new york and he always said if you're responsible for more than 27% of your revenues, you're not running your practice like a business. And the doctors would say, 27%, are you kidding me? I'm 97% of it, you know? And, um, but that was the mind shift chain. You know, it's time to look at your practice as a business and say, are you able to walk away? Are you able to be sick? Are you able to go on vacation? Um, are you able to have an unforeseen incident happen, like your house burned down? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, so back to the staff. And talk about your business structure because you are quite a business there. You're not just you, – describe your practice physically and, and how it's set up. So um, we have two locations. Our main location is uh, in Frontenac, Missouri. They're both St. Louis, um, so one neighborhood in St. Louis. Um, that location is 16,000 square feet. Um, the ground floor, 8,000 square feet, is all clinical. There is no office space. There is no clerical. There is no storage. It's all clinical on the ground floor. Um, one half of the ground floor is um, my surgery center and five or six exam rooms that I use when I'm doing pre-ops and post-ops and consults and that kind of stuff. Um, 
And when I'm not in there, then sometimes my nurses will actually spill over into those rooms and use them as injection rooms. That's the half of the ground floor. The other half of the ground floor is branded that Omniderm Spa brand. Um, and it is all the non-surgical. So um, toxins, fillers, um, devices, um, aesthetics, um, spray tans, and that when, they, when we used to have them. Um, and so that's the other half of the ground floor. So those are the two general pieces of the ground floor of that building. Um, our second location is about 3,000, 3,500 square feet. And it's just an echo of the non-surgical side again. Same services. Um, so that's all the clinical stuff. And then on our back to our main building, the top 8,000 square feet is our administrative kind of back of house area. So half of it's dedicated to our call center and offices um, and staff break room and staff gym and that kind of stuff. And the other half is um, storage and shipping and receiving. Um, so we have all of the all of the things that patients don't need to see pulled up away from where the patients actually go. So they're it's totally isolated from the rest of the rest of the practice. Okay, and like I mentioned to you earlier, um, your office was eight miles away from the other one. So I said, what was the point? Like, why would you have two locations? Because I just have found that if the doctor's not nearby managing things, it can it's like the wild wild west when in another location you have to really know why you have another location i guess and a lot of them have another location 30 miles away because they're pulling or they think they're going to pull i again i would just look at those numbers is that working out or is it just a distraction or whatever but for you you needed to just because to address the demand is that yeah. right yeah so for my you? house actually my house is actually halfway between both locations so i kind of <laughs> it's easy that way yeah. Um, we were out of space and out of parking at our primary. We're still out of parking at our primary location. Our employees have to park off site, or at least 10 of them have to park off site just to leave space for the actual patients. Because mm -hmm. um, we only have 40 parking slots in our, in our lot. And so um, if, you know, we have close to 50 employees, let's say 30 of them are working at Frontenac on any given day, that's most of your parking lot, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a problem. We don't have public transportation in St. Louis. So that becomes a big problem. So um, we couldn't actually see enough patients. We didn't. We, we could. We had more patient demand than we could handle with the staff that we could actually park. Uh, uh, and with uh, this is this is the, this is the truth. Um, and so we have a we have a reciprocal deal with a building two doors down from us that is a steakhouse, and they don't they don't open until five p.m. and we're mostly closed by six. So we let them park their customers and employees at our lot in the evening. That we park. They let us park ten of our employees at their the lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, it worked out pretty well. Um, but even so, it was we still didn't have enough space. We had we had patient demand for which we could add providers, and providers require support people to, to make them efficient. We couldn't do it. There was nowhere to put everybody, and so um, we added the other location intentionally close because I, I was telling Catherine before this interview, I would have I would have added it in the next building over if I could have. I mean, it's not about. We, it was not a way to get more patients. The getting more patients have been really lucky with. It's meant it was a way to handle the patients that we are getting without making it feel crowded and, and hustly, bustly, and congested. This is all pre-COVID. This was 2016 when he did this. We, it was feeling too crowded. And so the other location is not far away. Um, it is, it, patients really don't care which one they're asked to go to because they're so close to one another. As a matter of fact, you were talking about culture. So my staff is not allowed to work at one or the other location. So every staff member has to work at least one day in each location. So um, if it's a three-day week staff member, at least one of those three days has to be on one campus, and then the other two could be on the other. They can't be and what's the point? to keep the staff integrated, mm -hmm. to keep the um, to keep them kind of knowing each other to keep them um, familiar with each other to keep have patients see familiar faces depending on where they go um, to keep the approach and and feeling and you were saying that we overuse the word culture i think but to keep the culture the same in the two offices so they don't spiral off into two different directions and it becomes that us and them thing and you've got to keep it together as a team you all have to be there for the good of the practice not for the good of gladys you know you know that is Wow, if you can make that happen, good for you, because it's not easy to, it's, it's um, what do you call it, hoarding cats or whatever? Hurting, hurding cats, oh, hurting. yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. If, yeah, if you get a call from the other offices from someone you never see except the once a month staff meeting, and you never interact with them, and you don't really know who they are, and they're asking you a favor, and you're kind of busy and irritated, 
it's easier to say no than if you see them once in a while. And if you like them, it's not because you see them, you're going to say yes because you're afraid you're going to see them. You're going to say yes because you become friends with them because you see them every week, you know? Right. And so uh, we, we th- there is only one exception. I have one employee that only works at one office. Um, and that's a, a different reason for that. And I can tell you that if you want, but. Um, yes, we're dying to know. But why uh, is she the prima donna? Why, okay. she, why is she the entitled one? Uh, she, she's not entitled. She's saddled with it. Um, if you, if you do have this situation where, like I said, everyone else is, is tasked with working at both sites at some point during the week, no one creates continuity at that second office. So there has to be someone that was there Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday so that there is a thread of continuity going through the week so that we know what happened yesterday and we know what the issue was yesterday and we know what we are expecting to happen today. And it's too difficult to try to say, well, so-and-so works Monday and Tuesday and this one's with Tuesday and Wednesday and then they're going to pass along information. So we have one person, there's actually a medical assistant that is there five days a week and she is the, she is the, the continuity in that, inside that office. So that's the one exception. Total sense. Good for you. Yeah, that, that's a great idea because um, they that um, that us and them thing is so it happens so quickly you don't even see it coming. Um, but then as a consultant, when you're called in, you can hear them saying, "Well, they," you know, you can yeah. you can hear that, and you've done a good job of keeping everybody integrated. Um, is there any kind of bonus structure? Um, is it do do they win as a team or do they win individually? How do you keep everyone motivated? Without going into great detail, um, I used to do the Ed Williams bonus structure. I did this. Um, I started practice private practice in 2006, and up until 2010, I did the Ed Williams bonus structure, which is um, bonuses are based on. And he may no longer do this anymore, but bonuses are based on. Have this quarter do versus the same quarter last year? What's the incremental growth? And based on that incremental growth, we'll create a, a bonus that's shared equally based on like how many full time equivalents you are. You know, if you're a full time equivalent, you get a full share of the bonus pool. And if you're a half of a full time equivalent, you get half the share of a bonus pool. Um, and I did that for the first four years that I was around. And it worked, it worked well. Um, when I moved from the office I was in then to my, my main office now, we took a sudden increase in um, overhead. You know, I moved from a, a single 3,500 square foot office in a not so nice building to a 16,000 square foot building in the nicest part of St. Louis. And so what I said to those employees that were with me at that time was, I can't guarantee that you're going to earn a bonus at all this next year or two or three because I don't know that we're going to have year-on-year growth for a while. Like, Because all of a sudden, I worked so much higher. So I did this, I just increased all their base salaries by the equivalent of the bonus they would have gotten. So if they got, let's say if the average bonus was $1,000 in that quarter, that's $2 an hour. You know, So I took all their base salaries and bumped them $2 an hour. So this is your, I'm going to guarantee you get that, um, but we're killing that bonus plan for a little while because it didn't. I didn't know if it would work or not. Um, so what happened? How did they? How did that go? Oh, they loved it. They got their they got their quarterly bonus as if it was a good quarter, just built into their payroll. It was, uh, yeah. you know. So I, I was, basically, I said I don't want you guys being penalized because we're taking a risk on our end. Um, and did the productivity and the attitude still stay high? It it did. Um, it, it was easier with a small team. You know, that I had like seven or eight people, so it's easier with a small team. Um, as we've added more providers, then. Um, we then started put bringing back in more incentive structures that are person dependent. So when we, as we, as we reintroduced incentive structures, um, they became tied to personal, um, personal productivity. revenue, personal productivity, yeah. mm-hmm. um, which requires really mature employees, you know? So um, it, the good thing about the team approach is that, um, it doesn't matter, you know, who's played the bone lands on, you know, at some point at the end of the day, it's all split up and everybody's happy. Um, the bad thing is the high, the high producers, even if they're not bitter, they're not, they're not elated, you know, because y'all get 10% of the extra revenue that I generate. Um, when it's more individually driven, um, there's less bitterness from the high producers. Um, and they're, they really feel like they're 
they're going to see they're going to see reward directly based on their own efforts, which I think is a you know it's kind of a meritocracy in that way. But you have to make sure you're hiring people that are not going to sell stuff that's not that's not right. You know that that really have the patient's best interest at heart. You have to have a really good team. Let's say among my injectors, you know, if someone comes up, they need a Botox touch up or something else, but they weren't the one that did the Botox. They really have to have a team spirit because sometimes I'm going to help your patient. Sometimes you're going to help my patient. We're not going to keep track. We're not going to, you know, do micro math to try to figure this all out. This is one of the benefits you have of being in this practice. And it's one of the burdens you bear, bear in being in this practice. And if you have, if you're that picky about every little move needs to be compensated you know you're not welcome here like we have a it's it is it is capitalist but there's a little bit of a socialist underpinning like we're all in this together and you can't be you can't be that neurotic about every little diamond dollar i'll tell you there is no answer there's no one answer to this you have to know your personalities that you have on board but i will tell you um i always my whole thing is finding rock stars the problem with a rock star is they don't want to work with losers. You know, they don't want to work with mediocrity. And trying to balance that out is killer. Because on the one hand, when they plan as a team and work together as a team and celebrate together as a team, then they'll hold each other up. They'll hold each other accountable. Like the, the one that's, um, you know, not doing their fair share, they'll call them out. But, but if you have that rock star who's like the entitled one, like I, you know, coordinators, quite frankly, I'm, I have a very strong sales background. I've never gotten a paycheck. I've always worked off a of commission. I've never gotten paid unless I produced period. And, but, but I'm not a good team player. So, you know, you're trying to figure that out. So if you want somebody to crush it, but they're not going to play well with every, with the others in the sandbox, um, you have to deal with that. And with, when you have a team as big as yours, culture is everything for you. The, yeah. it, I, Dear Lord, like, do you have like team get togethers or how do you keep everybody motivated? Because if you're running this machine, it almost sounds like a machine. You've got a busy, busy practice there. Um, is there any burnout or how do you avoid it? I, you know, every, everyone has bad days. I mean, it, it, I would be lying. We said, oh, it's just utopia. And everyone's smiling always. We're really lucky, though. I mean, we, we've had a couple bad hires and the bad hires don't last because exactly what you're talking about whether they're not hard enough workers or they have the wrong attitude or they just don't we, we take our hiring process very seriously we sometimes still get it wrong and you're absolutely right it becomes painfully obvious in the first few weeks that this is not going to work and so part of i think um part of having a good culture is actually you know there might be two or three people that are pretty well qualified but you go who's actually going to be my everybody hire my my concern is we're going to break it like who's going to break our system you know like and so Hiring is important. As far as um, our people together, um, you know, pre-COVID, um, we used to do you know, at least quarterly little, you know, fun events and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not exactly sure how we'll do that in the next, in the next but, you know, COVID's not going to be around forever. It'll be sometime between six months and six years from now. It'll be all over. Um, so we will have group events again. Um, it, I, I just... I don't have a great answer for why for why the, the culture is as good as it is. I think, you know, we treat them really well. They treat each other really well. Um, they really do. They really do celebrate each other's victories and they really do look out for each other's problems. Um, a lot of that comes back down to our office manager, who, again, is the people person in my practice. She, she's got her finger on a lot of it. Um, I wish I could just tell you this is the secret sauce, but there, there isn't one. Do you stay out of it mainly? Do you stay out of it and let that? Right hand person handle all the staff issues. Can anybody get to you? Do you okay. have yeah. here? So well, so it's it's a it's a balance again. So um, I I try to I don't make it to the satellite office when it's open hardly ever. Um, but that's okay because I see all those employees every week when they come to the main office. Um, so I don't physically get into the satellite office when it's open hardly ever. Um, but anytime I'm free, I mean I you've heard the phrase managed by walking around. Like I literally walk around the building and just kind of at least, you know, say how do people just kind of look at people's expressions, kind of take their, take their emotional assessment, just kind of see how things are looking and feeling. Um, and so I'm all over that building, both upstairs and downstairs um, many times every day um, as are my managers. Um, and can anyone get to me? Sure. Anyone can always email me or text me or, or, you know, just walk in my office. But the reality is, that happened more when I was 35 and had six people. Mm. Um, 
it's a little kind of bittersweet because as you get to be, you know, late forties and have more people, you want to be best friends with everybody, but they don't necessarily want to be best friends with you anymore because it really is a boss versus employee thing at some point. You know, there's it, no matter how much you like each other, there's still that little bit of a bump. Um, and so a lot of them actually do feel much more comfortable talking to my office manager. You know, um, we actually have a structure within that. So just like it would be impossible for me to directly oversee 45 to 50 people that report all directly to me, it would be impossible and unrealistic for me to expect her to do it. You know, so it'd be, um, her name is Allie. So I can't say, Allie, you need to directly oversee every one of these people. That's not, you know, big trees don't have leaves coming out the trunk. You know, you have branches and stems. And so we, we have a leadership structure within each group. So we have each of our departments as kind of a department head. Okay. And so the department head, um, it's not a paid position. It's it's a position you get if you want and if you if they think you're the right person for it. Um, and your job really is not to boss around the other receptionist. Your job is to bring to Allie and bring to me things that would make the receptionist's job easier. You know, so it's not like I'm here to tell you how to do your job better. It's I'm here maybe a little bit of that, but mostly, you know, we noticed the reception is struggling with is all the batteries are dying on or whatever, or that, you know, that this printer is ridiculous or, you know, can we fix the process for new patient paperwork? Like basically the kind of a, a, a mouthpiece. So each individual reception, it doesn't necessarily have to come upstream. You know what I mean? They're welcome to, but their, their, their department head is the one looking out for them. But it's also she's also the one that you know if Ali needs to get a message out to all the receptions directly, emails are not super efficient or you know WhatsApp's not super efficient. So she'll talk to that department head and say make sure that your team knows this, and then that gets it that gets it fed out. So it's a it's a funnel both directions a communications funnel. Mm-hmm. Um, each our medical assistants have a department head, our OR team has one, our nurse injectors have one, our estheticians have one, our reception team has one, um, our consult coordinators have one, um, and so once a month we actually have just the department heads meet so we have we have a staff meeting monthly which is uh just under an hour and we ask we ask everyone to come to it and this will probably be virtual for a little while here um but we have a staff meeting monthly and then staggered two weeks is the monthly just department head meetings where we just bring in the the kind of runners of each department and talk through things that we might implement things that we you don't want to tell when you have a group this size, you don't want information getting out half baked because it, it just makes everyone anxious, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you let out half baked ideas. So we take our half baked ideas to our, our department heads, you know, what do you think about this before we let them out to greater things? So. Wow. Um, did you take a lot of leadership courses? How did you know how to build this business structure? Um, I, I have a lot of good friends. So Ed, you mentioned Ed Williams. So Ed Williams is a phenomenal leader. Um, there's a guy in uh, Michigan, Chip Mock, that has built a huge, oh, yeah. huge multi, multi, multi arm practice. I, I like to go visit people's um, yeah. practices. And I, I used to, two or three practices a year, I'd go visit either because there's something surgical I wanted to see, or in Chip's case, it was, uh, I just want to see how he ran his business, you know. Yeah. Um, Nick Brandy, do you know Nick Brandy? I don't. He is, he's, one, he's a top five allergen account. He's in Pittsburgh. His uh, practice is called the Skin Center. Um, Nick and his brother, Jerry. Jerry runs the place. Nick is the primary surgeon, although Nick is retired now. Um, again, the top five allergen account, like five or six satellite offices, um, you know, multiple injectors, that kind of stuff. So I've had friends that have been here before me. Um, and so I, I have not taken any leadership courses proper. Um, I, pro- I, was, I probably should probably be better if I did. Hey, visiting, visiting and role modeling others. That's the best shortcut in the, in the world and the best like, on the streets, you know, experience you can possibly get. So good for you for visiting others. I think that's a great idea. Um, we're going to switch gears now and talk about marketing because either you're in the best location on the planet. You have no, no competition by you or is St. Louis like the place to be for um, because everybody I work with has so many competitors nearby and they don't have a big flow of patients like and never ending patients. Not many, not many complain about uh, they have too much demand. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> so so how how are you making that happen? You, you're making that happen, by the way. It's not just happening by accident. So you must have quite a marketing machine out there. 
working for you? I, I think we're lucky. So um, we we do have significant we do have significant competitors there. We we're really I mean I, I, can't, I don't remember what the data is, but per capita, St. Louis is like it's in, it's definitely top ten for for cosmetic surgery per capita as far as you know how many people will inject you or cut you open. St. Louis were definitely top ten, um, which you would not expect, but but we are. Um, a lot of it comes down to um, messaging. So you know, I really focus really hard on on the surgical things that I do, and and uh, you know, we're trying to message this um, expertise and um, technical excellence, and um, that kind of message goes out. Um, at the same time, we're you know it's like every practice. At the same time, we're trying to message um, that we are friendly and caring and um, approachable, and you know the kind of people you want to be with, even if they're not working on you. You know, we're trying to message that. Um, and then you know, as social media has come out, um, it really lets people get to know me a little bit and my practice a little bit. And uh, you know, by the time people contact us, they've already committed. Like, but they really there's not a lot of selling by the time they contact us. They've sold themselves watching, just watching for a year or two, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then my providers all have their own social media. And this is always a point of contention with, with a lot of my colleagues oh, is, is should the providers be allowed to post mm-hmm. pictures? Should the providers have their own socials? Should the provider's social be super branded with your practice? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, is it, like it's sometimes it's a weird competition, you know, like um, within a practice, you know, like I, I would love, and it's happened. I, you know, I want people to come ask for my injectors over me. That's my goal, you know, because only I can operate, you know, and they can inject and they're fantastic. And so my goal is to obsolete myself in that. I have friends that, that hire junior associates or, or injectors, but they can't let the patient go when they come in. They want to do it. You know? <laughs> so it's like, you have to, you have to be able to like, give things up too and that's a large part of that whole leadership thing is you know i i don't micromanage every little decision i i'll tell you a little more about the leadership in a minute if you want but um i give i give direction to my team in the morning that i'm that i'm out of it you know so every morning that practice administrator and practice manager and i we do basically a morning stand-up you know we're, we're together for 15 to 20 minutes where we review our active items list our kind of sunday items list um, make our decisions, set our path, review our data, and then I don't see them until the next morning. Um, but they have a course for the day. They know exactly what they're doing, and I'm out of it. I, I let them do what they do, and then we reconvene next morning. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with like this. We bring on injectors, bring on estheticians. I, if you look at any of my people's accounts, they're very autonomous. I mean, I, I kind of alluded to, I've been in private practice since 2006, but I was I've in university practice for two years before that. Um, and the thing that made me leave university practice was not money. It was just being suffocated. I felt like I could not develop as a surgeon with all the, you know, they're, they're trying so hard to confine me to do, to not leave. I was like, I can't be here, you know? Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I've given them, not given them, they have lots of autonomy and lots. I mean, they, they, have, they have to behave within certain bounds and be respectable, but they're, Good human beings, so they do that anyway. But your uh, breaking is not built into their social. Not, not, okay. not significantly. Not significantly. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, and often like you'll see like our logo on their scrubs, or you know, if they have us, if they have my social person produce a video for them, our logo may appear somewhere. But we don't really, we don't really uh, demand or enforce. You know, if you put out a piece on social that you have to say you work here and blah blah blah. I mean, just put out the piece. You know, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's been really helpful too. So we don't have one voice out there trying to bring in people. Mm-hmm. I'm doing it, um, but people love their providers, and the, their providers that they love get other patients that get referred directly to them because they love that provider. You know, so mm-hmm. it's it's they're they're not just there to help handle the work. They they actually generate income, incoming patients on their own too. For sure. Um, and are they good about cross promoting to you? Like, do all arrows point to surgery or no? So, um, yes. When when it is a patient that is not best served by non surgical treatment, they're they're certainly not going to refer to another facial plastic surgeon in town. They'll certainly refer to me. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but that, but like the goal isn't, we built our surgical practice backwards from the average. So um, I think the, the conventional thinking is, this is all pre-social media, is, you know, you get people in the door with something easy and cheap, like an injection, and then, you know, hopefully they'll convert to surgery someday. Um, pre-social media, you know, I'm thinking I'm spending $2,500 on this magazine ad or $20,000 on this billboard. I want it to generate a $20,000 facelift. I don't want it to generate a $200 injection, you know? And so we built our spa side backwards. So when we started, it was just a surgical practice. And every message I put out there was about surgery. And by the time I got them in and operate on them, now going forward, retaining them with their, with their injections and peels and lasers, that's easy. They've, they've already made a big commitment, big decision to have surgery. Um, and so it's not like we bring people in for injections, hoping that we can convert them to surgery. The injections are their, they're their own end. They're their own goal. The, you know, a lot, a lot of people that are having injectables and, and lasers and non-surgical treatment are not going to be surgical candidates maybe ever. And that's not on their horizon. And that's not what they want. It's not what they need. You know, they're, they're, it's a different, you know, it's a different world. Like when we first started in this industry, plastic surgery was about fixing a deformity or reclaiming your looks from when you were younger. Mm -hmm. There's a whole third arm out there right now, which is I'm not deformed. I'm not ugly. I'm 19, but I want to look amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of living your best life, glow up, optimizing. These, that category didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago. And so, and it's also the fastest growing category and they're probably never going to become surgical. You know, they're mostly injectable. So it's not like every time we bring an injectable patient, we're thinking, how are we going to convert them to surgery? Perfectly happy to leave them as an injectable patient. What is the goal to keep them under an umbrella? You know, to keep them under your roof? Absolutely. So that's back to, let's say, spray tans or, you know, some of the facials are waxing. Um, you know, it. There is, again, I have employees that enjoy doing those. Um, patients do need those services. They're going to get them somewhere. And they're going to get them somewhere. And when they go to that place, it is also the lowest profit center in that building, too. And they're going to do their best to, to keep them for something that is a higher profit center, such as, you know, injections and lasers and everything else. So there is part of, part of the reason we offer those is specifically so they don't have to walk into another door. Gotcha. So for marketing channels. Um, you know, it's funny, you know how I first found you, um, I, you first came on my radar, I fly more than 100,000 miles a year, or I used to anyway, and now I don't go anywhere, but um, I saw you on the airplane, <laughs> so American yeah. Airlines Magazine, and then yeah. it was under the top stocks, and I thought, oh, and then I remember, I, I always look at that now, and I think, you guys, does this really work, and um, what I've noticed is, there are different reasons for doing it, it's very good for branding, I will say that. Um, I don't know how many people are in the air saying, oh, my God, I've got to call that guy. Um, I think it's it, um, it's not an easy straight shot. You know, looking at the magazine and getting into your office, I think, are, is a long road. <laughs> but um, I do like the branding part of that. Um, so for marketing channels, you're using that one. But did you get into the PPC and, and all of that? Like, how, how are you marketing yourself? Um, we currently do no PPC. Um, when, did you do it now? You did, did you used to, but didn't get good results, or what? Well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna break this up into pre-social media and post-social media. Yes. Yeah. Pre-social media, when I first started, I literally did newspaper ads, and uh, and they were effective. Like in my in my opinion, the ad has no matter what the vehicle is, the biggest piece of the real estate is taken up by a before and after picture, and what you say underneath absolutely doesn't matter. Like it's fewer words, but um, so those are gone. Um, now the only paid advertising we do is we do that, um, you know, to be voted into top docs, but then once you are, you know, when one of those slots open up, you can have one of those. So we do those. That's kind of an image advertising piece. Right. Just, and I know, you know, what image advertising is, but mm -hmm. for the listeners, it's not intended for them to look at that and go, oh, I'm going to call his office. Okay. It's intended to boost your reputation so that when they're finally in the market, they'll have been messed six, seven, eight times or, and then someone, they ask a friend, you know, who should I go to for my facelift? And if they happen to mention my name, it carries way more weight than if that's the first time they're exposed to it. Or if a friend asked them, who should I go to for my facelift? They probably spit my name out just because they've seen it that many times. So it's image advertising. I think it helps. Um, we do that as a paid ad. And I do some, been doing this about five years, six years, billboards in St. Louis. Yeah. 
I, um, I posted billboards in certain areas. They work beautifully. So, and, and literally my billboards have two pictures and three words on them. They have a before picture and mm-hmm. after picture as big as they can possibly be. Mm-hmm. And at the bottom, they either say neck by Nyack or nose by Nyack. And there's yep. nothing else on those billboards. Just two pictures and three words. No contact information, nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started, that. Was, those are the first time that I started using those two phrases was on those billboards. This is pre-social media. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew they were working because if you start typing phrases into Google, it, there's a thing called a long tail keyword. Will, will, it will complete, it will, mm-hmm. it will start to complete what you're typing for you. Do you know what I'm talking about? So it got to the point where I had not popularized those phrases anywhere else. But if you sat down and started typing nose by, Google would long tail keyword complete NIAC before you hit search. It's not like where you're on the results. It's predictive text Mm -hmm. um, or neck by. And so when I started seeing that behavior, I knew that people were literally looking at billboards and then going home and typing that phrase because those phrases come up based on consumer behavior, you know. So those are the only two paid ads we do. We do um, that magazine. And billboards. Everything else is social. Um, you had mentioned, and, and not paid social, just organic social. Um, you had mentioned pay per click. Mm-hmm. I'm a bad person to ask about that. The last time I used it was like 2010, maybe. Um, and we will probably use it again soon um, for other things. But um, we turned it off because my wait time, this is before we were handling our incoming consult inquiries well. So at that stage, if you called my office for a consultation, there was no pre-education, there was no screenings. When do you want your consult? Okay, we'll stick you on there. And so we were putting a lot of non-starters onto my consult list. And so my new consult wait time was two and a half, three months, and which is no good. It's, it's horrible because the, the serious patients can't get on the schedule. The ones that do book three months from now, they have, some of them had their surgery by the time their consult rolled. We call them up, be like, oh, we're missing your consult today. And she'd say, oh, I already have my rhinoplasty. I'm so sorry. You know? So we were totally mismanaging it. But we turned off pay-per-click so that we could you know, get, that, get the inquiries down a little bit. Mm-hmm. It didn't change a thing. Like our number of inquiries coming in, totally unchanged. Um, Where are these leads coming from? Osmosis or what? <laughs> Where are they coming from? I, I good SEO? You have a good SEO guy? Our, our SEO is good. So if you um, if you do if you search for things that matter to me, um, we place oh, well. Yeah. We place well on Google. Um, mm-hmm. Our SEO is good. Um, our word of mouth is good. Like right now, I re- I'm, I'm not just saying this. I think in St. Louis, if you were to ask people, you know, I'm looking for a guy that does noses or facelifts. Yep. I might not always be the first thing that they'll say. I'll be in the top two or three. You know, so I've been here long enough. I think that helps. Um, my again, my actual providers have have really meaningful reputations of their own. That really helps. And so just just literally organic, not even online, just person to person. You know, Corona style transmission is is huge, and it it really works. Um, and then social social is you can't you can't underestimate it. You know, it's 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 very powerful. And are you able to track it? Do you have good systems in place? Do you know somebody actually came in from social? I talk to people all the time, and here's what happens. When you, when on, I do a lot of uh, uh, phone training for staff, and we always ask, oh, so tell me, how'd you, heard about, how'd you hear about Dr. Nyack? And they'll say, oh, um, the internet or Instagram, let's say. And then when they get to know the patient better, it turns out the girlfriend mentioned you. Then they went to Instagram. Then they went to your website. So it's, got, it's gotten really complicated to find out the path. Way to you, but are you? Do you have a good handle on it? No, we, no, no. <laughs> and, and and it is it is just just as you said. I think it's it's artificial to say. You know, it's it's almost asking. It's like naming one ingredient in a recipe. You know, they they <laughs> they literally they they were touched by six different things: the, the airline flight, the billboard, their friend mentioned it, they saw an Instagram post. You know, so even if even if you were doing pay per click and you had a direct track from that click, it doesn't tell you anything more than that was the last time that you know so right. you don't you know we we used to do tracking phone numbers um when i did print ads i'd do tracking phone numbers with different phone numbers for different different ways mm-hmm. into the practice um the closest again the closest i can t- i came to being able to see something really made a difference was when I, I put those phrases up on the billboards i wasn't using them on social i didn't have them in a print ad i didn't have them anywhere but it changed google's predictive behavior so I knew those were dry. I knew people were responding to that 
but that's the closest I can tell you that, you know, we don't, we don't really, we ask it on our intake sheet and just right. like you said, they'll, they'll list one thing, Yeah. you know, but it, I don't know. All right. Um, do you, do you have any idea what your marketing budget is? Is it like a percentage of, do you, do you have a formula or do you just spend what you need to spend? All right, no, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I spend about $80,000 a year on billboards. Um, so about 20,000 a quarter. Okay. Um, and then I think the, um, I think the top docs runs about 3000 a month, something 3,500 a month, maybe something like that. Gotcha. And that's it. That's my marketing budget. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see what else, um, for, cause I love to talk about marketing. Um, Hey, by the way, how much time do you spend on social media? Fair amount. You know, it's funny. I, um, when I first started Facebook, it's probably close to, seven or eight or nine years ago um i did it solely it was actually at an aacs meeting one of the ones in orlando yeah. uh, and i remember thinking i need to do a business page you know and uh you can't do a business page without having a personal page and so i was like all right i'll sign up for a personal page just be able to do a business page and um that was that was a bad idea because <laughs> I, I do i do spend a fair amount of time on it you know but i do think it makes people feel connected to you as well so well, at the meetings, yeah. um, you know, now we talk about social media all the time at the practice yeah. management sessions, and um, some of the doctors are spending hours, 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 you know, five to seven yeah. hours um, yeah. a day. And, uh, and I used to think, are you out of your mind? Don't you have something better to do? But it's just, a sh it's just the way life is now. You have to market you, and it takes you to do that, you know, because yeah. the patient now wants to know who you are. And that's why they're going to social. They want to see who you are as a person. And, yeah. uh, there's no way around it now. So you're the you're the marketer and the and the and the manager and the surgeon and the oh my god and the dish with the bottle washer and all that. It's I'll tell you one of the things that I'm still having a really hard time um, figuring out is, as you said, you can't do it all. Mm -hmm. um, I have Jenna, who is my social media coordinator, who I love, and she's fantastic. But you can't have them kind of run it either because then it's not authentic and people don't like watching it. You know, so it's a it's a it's very interesting. I think you can probably look through my posts and reading the tone, you can tell when Jenna posted something or when I posted something. And that is probably not good. I know it's, it's, I know it's definitely not good. Like if I did, if I wanted it to be really effective, um, I would do more of it and she would do more on the kind of production end and I would do more on the posting end. But it, it really comes down to um, just time and desire and demand. Like what, what exactly is that going to come? You know, a lot of times like, couldn't you, if you brought on a partner, couldn't you do, you know, more surgeries and more whatever? And I'll be like, yeah, but what exactly, how does that going to impact my life? You know, if like, if I bring on another surgeon and pay them what they're worth and keep them happy and blah, blah, blah. Great. I'll make 10% more in a year mm -hmm. with a hundred percent more complication and stress yeah. and everything else. Like, is that really worth it? You know what I mean? So yeah. there's, al there's always the, like the second, it's not always just about the revenue piece. It's about just happiness and longevity is a big, is a big part of it how I run the practice, you know. Actually, so, I think, yeah. um, I know your cat. He's been in Instagram. We're, we'll yeah. bring him up here. Where's he hiding? Oh, there's <laughs> <the tail. laughs> This is Rocky. Oh, that is so funny. He's my oh, buddy. I should go get my dog. Where's my dog? Cash, come here. <laughs> no, I have him hiding. Um, that's adorable. Um, and actually, I was going to ask you about that, the business model. Are you trying to scale? Are you where you want to be? Or has COVID changed any of that for you? Like what your vision is? Right before COVID, we were looking for a third location. Actually, oh. we, we are maxed out of both places right now, right, right before COVID. Um, and you're going to think it's crazy. Yeah. We were going to do the same thing. We we're literally looking for a spot that was not that far away um, uh -huh. just to, just to take overflow. Um, and obviously that got put on hold. Um, I'm content. You know, like I, I'm, I'm happy with how things are right now. I think, um, I think we're going to give it, like I said, sometimes in six months and six years from now, we'll have this COVID thing figured out. Um, so I just kind of want to see how things play out in the next, like, we don't know what's going to happen in the fall. We don't know what's going to happen, you know, next spring. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I think right now it's more just kind of be thankful and be content and, uh, you know, enjoy where we are for a little while mode. Um, and sure. it, it seems, I, I'm, you can tell, like, you asked about, like, do I take any classes? Or yeah. I, 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 I've had pretty good intuition about when it's time to do something, you know, and um, I'll know when it's time to do something. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, 
Give me one big mistake you made, but that you learned tons from. Um, I hired a uh, an injector once um, that was a terrible fit culture-wise, um, but I didn't know it because I was so enamored as a person with that with that injector. Um, I was like, this is going to be great. I mean, hardest working person you ever met and uh, had such a desire to be a part of the practice. I thought that was going to be amazing. And and there were some subtle messages from my staff. That this probably isn't going to work out. And I didn't, I didn't listen to him. And it was a tense month and a half after that. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, nature took its course and everything was fine. But, and what's funny is I still, the individual, I still think the world of, uh-huh. you know, um, but it was, it, I, I could have seen it coming if I had paid more, not paid more attention. If I hadn't been so confident just based on the person, how right. wonderful the person was, if I hadn't been so confident that will kind of over, you know, and I really should have, I should have seen that coming. Um, well, and all the other ones are related to patients. All the other ones are like hundred percent of them are thinking that patient's going to be happy. You know, they're, they're just weird. They're going to, they're nice. It's going to be fine. And then. And then they're just as crazy, if not worse, after you operate on them. So those are the big ones, usually, is, is patient-related. Um, I've, I've actually surveyed several doctors about that, you know, about the patient selection. And they said, I had a feeling, you know, I had a feeling, but I, I said, I can handle this. It can't be that big of a deal. Well, it'll be fine. And no, it's not fine. But, and then um, the other one is, I should have listened to my staff, because they told me, they gave me a heads up, and I thought I could handle it. Yeah. I'll tell you, one of the, probably the best thing I ever did, though, um, is fixing that consult process, fixing the um, new inquiry to getting in front of me, the, the, mm-hmm. the okay. process between A and B, mm-hmm. that was probably the best thing that we ever did in terms of making making my time more, more valuable mm-hmm. or making the most out of my time. Yeah. For sure. And then the last, last question, what's something that we don't know about you that's interesting? Interesting. So, you know, I cook. You cook? Uh, no, I you, know, you don't. You don't follow my social at all. I love I to cook. Oh. That's my. That is. Uh, look through my social. Look for cooking with Mira. Well, you cook. know what's funny? I don't cook, so it, it doesn't yeah. even register for me. I don't even see anybody. I can't. I can't even see people cooking because it's so not what I want to do. Um, I, is there a specialty? Do you have a certain dish that I, you like? I cook everything. I I oh, love to cook. More complex, the better. I enjoy it. Um, so that that's one thing. Uh, oh, that's funny. Uh, do Do you know I eat? Still sing a, a fair amount, but I used to sing a lot. Do you know about that? You sing? I I I was like a semi-professional kind of. What type of music? All acapella, all men's acapella. Can you throw yeah. out a few bars? No, I, I I need a group. I'm not I'm not a good soloist. But oh. uh, I mean, the, my college group toured the world singing legitimately. Kidding. Well, you have something to fall back on if this doesn't work out. This game. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If we'll pull the team back together. Yeah, put them on. Exactly. Get you out, out on the road when we can travel again. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, what else? That's those. Are, I guess those are two two trivia things I can tell you. Wow, that's very interesting. And any um, last words of wisdom for anybody? Um. Yeah. So. Um, I'd say another another really good thing. If you ask, like one of the best things I've done in terms mm-hmm. of building a practice is when a staff member comes to you and says you know, I don't think I should be doing the job I'm doing. This is what I think I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Almost always the right choice. So when when someone says, you know, I, I don't think I should be doing this reception job, you know, I really think is there, here's this other, I, I'm literally going to describe this thing where I think I should be sitting and doing this thing. Mm-hmm. Almost always, especially if it's a, a good employee and, and someone that um, has, has the practice interest at heart and is, um, um, genuinely dedicated person mm-hmm. just say yes just do it um many 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 of my people are not in the seats that they came in mm-hmm. when they first when they first boarded the bus and mm-hmm. many of the seats that they have are currently occupying didn't exist when they boarded the bus and they are built for those positions and so i think that's if someone comes to you with a i have this crazy idea you know i want to do this i want to do this um mm-hmm. don't dismiss it so so true and people grow, people learn and they grow. And that's how you have an esthetician who ended up in upper management. Some people are, they, they rise, they rise to the challenge. And 
you just have to be sensitive to that because if you hold them back, they'll leave or they'll create havoc, you know, and it turns out it's, they don't have a bad attitude. They have a bad attitude about what you're making them do. So, I mean, that's, that's why I left the practice I was at for two years is, is I, I was, I could not develop. And sadly, this, this happens once in a while too. Um, and you, you know, people ask about, well, aren't you afraid your, your people are going to leave? And the answer is, yeah, I'm terrified. My people are going to leave. I'm always worried they're going to leave. And it doesn't mean, you know, they, they could, you know, like, so I try to make the environment so good um, that if they leave, it's not for something I could have controlled. Um, I think, I think the most common reason someone would leave is almost this, what we're talking about right now. They've evolved beyond what, what they're doing. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere in, there's nowhere for them to do more where I am. So, you know, there's certain positions where they might be super, super triple rock stars and they're amazing, but the next slot up needs a license. Mm-hmm. Or the next, the next office up is occupied by someone that's great and that's going to be there a while. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, sometimes people leave because, you know, it's not all about you. It's about them. You know, their life is developing and their career is developing. And, you know, it's sad, but sometimes where they need to develop into doesn't exist in your practice anymore. You know, and so, you know, it's just kind of you have to, you have to accept that that's going to happen sometimes. I hate it's it when it's business. But that's life and business. Um, you know what I find more of is having somebody there for 10 years who should have been gone eight years ago. You know, I see that way more often and nobody realizes how much toxic energy goes into that. Somebody who won't grow, who won't learn, who won't develop. I, I find that way more than I find that, you know, that one rock star who is being held back, you know? So, yeah, all right. We face that too. And it's always very, it's always a very emotional and difficult, <laughs> difficult separation at that point because they, you know, they feel, they take it very, very personally, you know. Well, that's people. We're people, you know, and, and just working with people. That's a challenge in itself. Um, so I didn't realize it was so late. We've been at this for a long time. I, it's really nice chatting <laughs> with you. You're very interesting. All right, everybody, I hope this was helpful to you. Um, please subscribe to Beauty in the Biz and uh, leave me a good review if you like what you hear here. We love five stars. And then, of course, share this with your colleagues and your staff. Um, that helps them grow and learn. Um, and then, of course, if you ever have any questions or feedback about Dr. Nyack and what he's up to, oh, how can we learn more about you? Where can they find you online? Well, uh, so my website, obviously, Nyack Plastic Surgery is a good start. Um, or on Facebook, we're at Nyack Plastic Surgery. Or on Instagram, we're at Nyack Plastic Surgery. And on YouTube, guess what? Nyack Plastic Surgery. <laughs> Nyack Plastic Good. You grabbed yeah. all of them. Good for you. Yeah. And then if you want to um, check me out on Instagram, I'm at Catherine Mainly MBA. Thanks so much, and take care. We hope you found valuable insight on this episode of Beauty and the Biz. For more episodes, tools, and Catherine's free book, visit www.catherinemaley.com. That's www.catherinemaley.com. And be sure to subscribe to get the latest practice building strategies delivered to you. And don't forget to share this Beauty and the Biz podcast with your staff and colleagues. Oh,